One of the most legendary ideas in the history of psychology is located in an unassuming triangle divided into five sections referred to universally simply as Maslow's Pyramid of Needs. The pyramid was the work of a 35-year-old Jewish psychologist of Russian origins called Abraham Maslow, who'd been looking since the start of his professional career for nothing less than the meaning of life. No longer part of the close-knit orthodox family of his youth, Maslow wanted to find out what could make life purposeful for people, himself included, in modern-day America, a country where the pursuit of money and fame seemed to have eclipsed any more interior or authentic aspirations. For Maslow, we all start with a set of utterly non-negotiable and basic physiological needs for food, water, warmth and rest. In addition, we have urgent safety needs for bodily security and protection from attack. But then we start to enter the spiritual domain. We need belongingness and love. We need friends and lovers. We need esteem and respect. And lastly, and most grandly, we are driven by what Maslow called an urge for self-actualization. Part of the reason why the description of these needs laid out in pyramid form has proved so persuasive is their capacity to capture a profound structural truth about human existence. Maslow was putting his finger with unusual deftness and precision on a set of answers to very large questions that tend to confuse and perplex us viciously. Namely, what are we really after? What do we long for? And how do we arrange our priorities and give due regard for the different and competing claims we have on our attention? Often, as we reflect upon it, we start to notice that we really haven't arranged and balanced our needs as wisely and elegantly as we might. Some lives have got an implausibly wide base. All the energy seems directed towards material accumulation. At the same time, there are lives with an opposite problem, where we've not paid due heed to our need to look after our fragile and vulnerable bodies. Maslow's beautifully simple visual cue is, above anything else, a portrait of a life lived in harmony with the complexities of our nature. We should, at our less frantic moments, use it to reflect with newfound focus on what it is we might do next. After close to 30 years or so of trying to perfect and clarify his thoughts on this hierarchy of human needs, Maslow came to this conclusion that the vast majority of people spend so much of their lives focusing on the pursuit of those base level needs of food and water and shelter and security and acceptance uh, that most people, in his opinion, won't ever really reach this pinnacle of that pyramid that he calls self-actualization. Now, he doesn't quite explain what that is in that video, which I edited down from seven minutes to two and a half, and so some of that got edited out. But here's a basic definition of self-actualization. It's said to be the desire to become more and more of what you truly are. It is the full realization of your true self and the stage where you are motivated to fulfill your purpose and to reach your full potential. There's actually, after I studied this a little bit, I actually learned that there's another more metaphysical, more spiritual level to this pyramid that Maslow added more closer to the end of his life that he called transcendence. And he didn't quite flesh it out yet before he passed away, but basically he believed that our highest need is to transcend our self, uh, to become selfless, and also to become united with what he refers to as the cosmos. Now, the guy was, a, was an atheist, so he, was, he didn't want to say that it was God, but basically speaking to this desire that we all have, to, uh, that we're born with, to connect with the God who created us. Uh, King Solomon wrote about this in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Some of you are familiar with this, but he said this, God has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. And he's also planted eternity. Now, this is the amplified version, is it? He's also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart. Everyone has it. Whether they want to acknowledge it or not, they have it because God's word says it. 
Um, so a, a divine sense of purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. So what Maslow is trying to communicate here through this hierarchy of needs is that in addition to our basic needs of you know, food, water, shelter, and those things, we have these more complicated needs, this deep need in our soul to be all that we were created to be and to discover our God-given purpose, and not just to discover it, but actually walk in it and to fulfill it, and to satisfy this mysterious longing that has been planted in our hearts that only God can fulfill. But what Maslow concluded is that you know, when our basic needs, when, when food and water and safety and, and a sense of belonging and acceptance, when those things aren't being satisfied, we have a very, very difficult time moving forward and addressing those higher needs that really promote spiritual growth. And, and I don't know how he came up with this number, but Maslow actually estimated that only about 2% of people move on to this point of self-actualization and transcendence. And the short people, the short list that he had on there was like people like Gandhi and, and Mother Teresa and, and Martin Luther King. I mean, like, wow. So he said only about 2% of folks ever really make it to that level of self-actualization and transcendence. Uh, because based on his studies, most people just get so bogged down on just trying to survive and make a living and pay the bills and put food on the table that they don't really have the time or they don't make the time to pursue those higher level things, those spiritual things. And, you know, that, that makes sense. I mean, think if you're a person who, man, you're hustling, you, you, you're working two jobs to try to make ends meet and they don't pay that much, uh, working so many hours that you hardly have any time to spend with your spouse or your kids or your friends. Uh, and then you realize, man, I don't even know that I got enough to pay rent this much, so, uh, rent this year, so you're, you're lacking security. Well, you're probably not going to be thinking about spiritual things all that much. Or if you do, it'll be probably questions that you're wrestling with, you know, certain spiritual realities that are being called into question because of what you experience. Like, for example, you might be wondering, well, why is Jesus, who said that he came to give me life and to give me life abundantly, well, why has he seemed to now have abandoned me in my time of need? I mean, that might be the extent of the spiritual um, questions that you're asking. You're like, Jesus, what, meet my physical needs so that I can begin to focus on the spiritual. And, and look, Jesus, is, he's so good. He is so faithful and kind and mercy that he, you know, he'll answer, sometimes he'll answer a prayer like that. But can you see how uh, this prayer, the way it's stated like that, you know, meet my physical needs first and then I'll pursue the spiritual, how it's, it's actually putting physical needs before those higher needs, those spiritual needs. It's putting physical needs above spiritual. And Jesus is concerned about our physical needs. In Matthew 6, he is very clear about this. I'll read it for you if you don't remember. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 25 and 26, he says, don't worry about, don't worry about everyday life, whether you're going to have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food? and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns because your heavenly Father, he feeds them. And so aren't you more valuable than them? So just don't worry about all those physical things. And yet we, we, we do. We spend a lot of time worrying about that. You know, and the Lord does care. He cares about our most basic needs and he will often, and he's done it for me countless times and I'm sure for you, countless times proven himself to be faithful to make provision for us in our time of need. But at the same time, Jesus really flips Maslow's hierarchy of, hierarchy of needs on his head. Uh, what I mean by that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that in this model of, of uh, human behavior, it's all about like, get your physical needs met first. Get your social and emotional needs met first. And then you kind of move on to these more advanced, more important spiritual needs. Well, you know what Jesus says about that? Jesus says, nope. He gives us the correct order of things right there in Matthew 6 after having spoken about the birds. Look at the birds of the air, okay? He says, seek first the kingdom. Stop worrying about all this other stuff. You're tripping on that? That'll, 
we'll take care of that, but stop tripping on that and pursue first, seek first, above all else, my kingdom, me and my kingdom, and then all these other things will be added to you. See, unlike Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Jesus says that it's the spiritual pursuit of God's kingdom that is to be our greatest motivation. And then he says, all these things will be added to you. And I, I want to read a portion of scripture where Jesus really makes this point clear. And it's in John uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 25. And just to kind of give you a bit of context for what we'll be reading here in a moment. Uh, this is an account of an interaction that Jesus has with a group of people who had only d d the day before witnessed him performing this incredible miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 with just two loaves and, uh, I mean, yeah, two fish and five loaves. And it's probably even more than 5,000. That's 5,000 men, but there could have been women and children, just a, a gang of people that Jesus fed miraculously. Does everybody know that story? If you do, raise your hand for me, do me a favor, or I'm gonna read the whole thing. Okay, good, so I'm not gonna read that. So that saves us a couple of minutes. <laughs> Thank you, bless your hearts. <laughs> okay, so um, you know the story. Most people, even non-believers, know the story of what Jesus did. Um, but anyway, it's this incredible miracle where he provided miraculously food for thousands. Well, the next day this crowd comes looking for Jesus. And when they find him, this is, this is what, what he says, okay? They find him, they hunt him down. And he says, he's looking at him. He says, you know what? I know, where you're, I know why you're here, and I'm telling you the truth. You are looking for me because you ate the bread that I provided for you, and you had all that you wanted. You provided more than enough, an abundant amount. Um, not because you understood the point of the miracles that I'm performing, which were to essentially point to his divinity and his role as Messiah, not because you understood the point of my miracles. See, don't work for food that spoils. Don't work for food that spoils. Instead, work for the food that lasts for eternal life, or for eternity. This is the food which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has put his mark of approval on him. So Jesus is telling him, just really quickly here, that there's a distinct difference between the kind of bread that we often seek out that just, you know, it just gets old, moldy, crusty, stale, uh, physical bread that perishes over time. He's comparing that with the kind of spiritual bread that he offers that will last forever. Uh, but they ask him, what can we do in order to do what God wants us to do? Which is a very, very good question that they're asking him here. To, to ask Jesus, what can we do in order to do what it is that God wants us to do? This is a, a great question. This is, it's a spiritual question that has the potential to bring them to a place of understanding God's will for their life, God's perfect, uh, perfect pur purpose for their life, and move them towards spiritual maturity. I mean, it's a really, really great question that each one of us should ask on the daily. We should get in the habit of asking the Lord, like, God, what is it that you want me to do today? Or what is it, Father, that, what can I do in this moment right now, God, to align my life and my spirit and my desires with your desires? I mean, that's a really powerful question that they're asking here. Um, but this group of people, as much as a really great question, it sounds like they're on the right track, it really quickly goes south. Right, so John chapter 6, verse 30. And so they asked him, well, okay, so what can we do in order to do what God wants us to do? Okay, well, Jesus answered, what God wants you to do is to believe in the one he sent. And they replied, well, well what miracle will you perform that we might see it and believe in you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, just as the scriptures say, yeah, that he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I mean, these people are just dumb, right? They're not very bright. They're, they're asking Jesus to, to perform a miracle like the one that God performed for their ancestors while they were in the desert and God provided this sweet substance, a heavenly uh, substance called manna. And it was uh, provided to make sure that they wouldn't go hungry. It appeared every day and there was always enough to feed them. More than what they needed was there. God provided that. And it was truly miraculous what God did for their ancestors there. 
But these folks are, they're, they're standing there in front of Jesus. They have a short memory because, again, as I said, it was just a day earlier that he provided them with bread and thousands of others with bread that he knew that they needed when he multiplied those fish and the loaves. He had already performed that miracle. And here they're asking him to, well, do something. Show us, provide us some bread. Give us something tangible here. Then we'll believe you. It's, they're testing Jesus. And, and how are they testing him? They want him to provide them with that base level need of bread, what my body needs, um, before they'll consider doing the more important spiritual thing that God wants them to do, which is to place their faith in his son, Jesus. It's like, provide us with the bread, and then we'll do the spiritual thing. And so Jesus says, he needs to correct their thinking. And so Jesus said, I tell you the truth. First of all, he says, it wasn't even Moses who gave you this bread from heaven. My father did. And now, the same father who was faithful to your ancestors then is now faithful to you in that now he offers you the true bread from heaven. Manna was just a picture. Jesus now standing before them is the reality. He says, uh, now he offers you the true bread from heaven, and then he, he wants to make it clear to them uh, what he's talking about, and so he goes on to tell them. True, the true bread of God is the one who comes down. Not the one that, it's, not, it's interesting the way he phrases this. Hold on. The true bread of God is the one who comes down, not the one that comes down, the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Clueless, they reply, sir, they said, well, we want that bread. It says like they still don't get it. He's like, I'm, you knuckleheads, I'm telling you, you're asking me for bread that's gonna perish. I'm telling you I can give you the bread that will never go stale, that will, it's everlasting. And, and God sent him. I'm like, what do you, yeah, we want that kind of bread. Give us that bread every day. And they're still looking for Jesus to provide them with something that will satisfy their physical hunger while he's offering them a kind of bread that will truly satisfy them at the deepest level of their being. And he's like, man, you guys don't get it. Okay, they don't get it. So this time he makes sure they really understand who he's talking about. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But here you guys are. You're, he says, you haven't believed in me. Even though you've seen me. Even though you've seen the miracle. I gave you bread. It wasn't enough for you. There's never enough bread. It's an insatiable appetite. More, 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 more. You just looking for it in the wrong places. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be thirsty hungry again. Okay, but you haven't believed me even though you have seen me. And it's my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So in the end, Jesus doesn't give them this physical bread that they're asking for, not because he's mean or that he doesn't care about, his, about their physical needs, because he's proven time and time again that he absolutely cares for people's physical needs. When, right before he feeds the 5,000, he's sitting there looking upon him. It says he looked at the crowd and had compassion on them, and he healed all their sick. Then he goes on, so that's a physical need. Then he goes on to feed them because he knows they're hungry. Jesus absolutely proved that he cares about their physical needs. So it's not that he doesn't care about that. Um, he didn't give them bread, first of all, because he was trying to test him, and he wasn't having that. But it was also because he needed them. He wanted them to come to an understanding that man does not live by bread alone. And that the pursuit of physical things to satisfy you know, this insatiable hunger that we have, it's a never-ending, fruitless struggle. We know this by experience. It's just it's never enough. Never enough vacations. Never enough money. Never enough whatever it is. And that's because... In the real hierarchy of our needs, our most pressing need isn't physical. It's spiritual, as uh, Solomon the Wise says, and it, and it can only be satisfied, it can only be satisfied by Jesus, the bread 
of life. We know this to be true by experience. We know it because we, we see a lot of, maybe you know wealthy people, if not, we see a lot, of, a lot of wealthy and famous people who have pretty much anything they want. As far as Maslow's uh, pyramid is concerned, man, you look at them, people would assume that all their levels of needs are abundantly met, and they're probably on their way to transcendence and self-actualization. They can have their fill of the most exquisite, expensive food. They can wear all the latest designer gear. Uh, their safety needs are met on that next tier up. Their safety needs are met because they have the, a fat mansion on a private island with private security. They're not afraid of somebody uh, coming into their place. They got security. Uh, they never have to really worry about whether they can make ends meet moving up the thing, they, they, their need for love and belonging is met because, man, they got tons of people writing them fan mail and, and, and liking their posts and all their, these friends who want to hang out with them all the time. So that need would be seemingly met. They got, move it up there, they got prestige, they got success, and they seem to be there at the top realizing their own you know, personal potential as they make a fortune doing what it is that they seem to be so talented and passionate about, right? But then, how many times have we seen these tragic stories of these same people who seem to be so happy, living out their dreams, and who look like they've reached the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but then we hear the news, the very sad, tragic news, that they take their own life. And it's so incredibly sad, but we see it all the time. And I think the reason why we see that all the time is because I think there's something not quite right with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If our high, uh, highest need, according to Maslow, is self-actualization, you know, being all that we can be and becoming our most truest self. Well, how do you even know if you've become your most truest self? Uh, what does that even mean, actually, to become your truest self? How do you even know if you're being all that you can be? I mean, seriously, I'm still trying to figure that out to a certain degree. See, the main goal of this life isn't really self-actualization. Sure, God's going to use your giftings and talents and your personality and all those things to, you know, as he works through you to help redeem the, this world. Yeah, that's, that's true. But the main goal of this life isn't self-actualization. In reality, our main goal and greatest need is knowing Jesus Christ and becoming more and more like him in every way. Let me try to explain this, because this is maybe, I think, what kept me up, because this is going to be... In fact, Jesus, Holy Spirit, please illuminate them and allow them to hear and understand what I'm going to communicate because this is something that a lot of folks just don't even think about. There's something very, 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 very profound the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians. It's actually something that changed my life and my perspective about faith in Jesus. Romans 6 has done that too, but Galatians, what I'm going to share with you is mind-blowing. And it's actually so mind-boggling that, again, not a lot of Christians have actually try to get their hearts and minds around what it actually means when he says it. I mean, he says it, what does it mean? People just tend to read past it. Well, what is it, Rude? It's this, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Write this down if you can, remember it, but think on this. Meditate on what's being said here. Paul said, and this is true for all of us who've come to faith in Christ, I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live. Why? Because, well, that old you died. What? I have been crucified with Christ. When he was on that cross, you were on the cross. When he died, you died. So I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the real life that I now have within this body, the real life, is a result of my trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Look, you see what he's saying here? It's so profound. Your old self is dead. And when you were raised to new life through faith in Christ, he actually 
became your life, your eternal, unending life. And he's living that life in you, through you, as you. And your mind is, what? So the goal of this life, as much as I appreciate the work of, of Abraham Maslow, bless his heart, uh, the goal of this life isn't really self-actualization. It's actually, a, I know, I'm almost done, baby boy. <laughs> Some of you are like, come on. Um, the goal of this life isn't self-actualization. It's actually self-crucifixion. And an actualization of the life of Jesus Christ being made evident in all that we say and all that we do. It's, again, it's Jesus living in us, as us, through us. And you see it communicated. All, once you see it, then you see it all over. It's, I mean, and I'll just read you a few. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, many of you are familiar with. Paul says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, well, what's the purpose? Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The goal is, as his life is there inside of us, it's to become like him in every way, to conform to the image of Jesus. To be all that you can be is to be like Jesus. That's really good, man. Uh, this is the amplified version of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Or, yeah, chapter 3, verse 18, where it says this. We all, with unveiled face, continually seeing, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into the image of his Son, from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord. See, we're being conformed day by day, increasingly into the image of his son. That is what we're actualizing, if that's the right word, in our life. Jesus Christ. Here's one, man, I'm getting pumped because this is really good. First John chapter three, verse two. Um, and this is the last one here. Dear friends, now we're children of God. If you've come to Jesus Christ by faith, you're a child of God. You have the spirit of God. You have Christ himself living in you. Awesome. Dear friends, now we're children of God. And what we will be, kind of like on the other side of this thing, has not yet been made known, but we, here's what we know. But we know that when Christ appears, when we finally see him face to face, we will be like him, for we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's all about being, that's really the end game at the top of the pyramid is Christ-likeness. And look, I'm not gonna try to pretend like I understand all the ins and outs of Maslow's hierarchy of of needs. There's some people who say, oh, that whole thing anyway, they, they, nobody listens to that anymore. Okay, well, whatever. I'm not a psychologist, but a lot of people still uh, look to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs as the, thing, the model for uh, what it is that motivates human behavior. But I'm not trying to pretend like I know all the ins and outs out of the thing. The man was way more brilliant than I am. But, but it seems to me that this top tier need to self-actualize and transcend. Man, it's also hazy. It's also nebulous. Like, who, again, who knows their, their full potential? Who knows what it means to be their truest self? How do you know if you're truly ever arriving at that place? Oh, now I am who I knew I could always be. Give me a break. I, I, it's just, I don't think you can. And that's not to say that in this life we can't, you know, we're going to fully become like Jesus. Uh, that's not true either. But see, the great thing about making the driving force of everything that we do uh, to become like Jesus, man, is that you can measure that. You know, as we pursue God's kingdom first and make our number one goal in life to become imitators of Christ, which is what we're supposed to do, and to walk in the same way that he walked. Man, well, that, see, now that's something you can set your eyes on, you know? Set your eyes on the prize, you know? Set your eyes uh, on those things that are above, not below, but where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I mean, these are things that you can actually set your eyes on. It's awesome to walk as he did, and as we do that, then you can be able to see the results of that in your daily life, then you'll know, you know what, I am living and walking in the purpose that God created me because he created me to be and walk 
in his love and also to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. And you'll begin to bear fruit that'll be visible for everyone to see. Jesus will become so real to you. He will so become your life that whether you have all your basic needs or not, you will still be absolutely satisfied. And you'll be like the Apostle Paul who said it this way, Philippians 4, and I'm closing it up. And it's not up here on the screen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. He says, I've learned how to be content, how to be satisfied, how to feel absolutely fulfilled with whatever I have. I know how to live with almost nothing, just broke, or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. How? What is the secret? How do you do that? Just broke, hungry, None of the, the lower level hierarchy of needs met, just, but still full of joy. The Apostle Paul says, what's the secret? Well, it's Christ. What his big secret to this, this complete fulfillment, no matter what the situation, is Jesus Christ. Jesus was his main pursuit, man. He said, let's set aside everything to know Jesus more fully in the power of his resurrection. Jesus was his life and his main pursuit pursuit and as he pursued jesus all that other stuff he like he says he said all that stuff is he calls it something that's refuse okay rubbish but you some of you know what he's really talking about there i'm just gonna say it. he's talking it's like uh, like dog poop that's just fun to say in church so i wanted to say that <laughs> but he was he's like consider all that rubbish who cares except that i lay hold of jesus christ I really don't care about all this stuff. To the point that he surrendered his neck to the executioner for the sake of the Savior who laid his life down for him so that he could experience eternal life. And so here's the, the question you know, with this. What is, that, what is it that you're spending most of your life pursuing? I mean, when you really think about it, and when you're really, really honest with yourself, again, we're never gonna fully pursue Jesus to the degree that we know that we should. But is there any pursuit of him? Yes, you come on Sunday, and I think that's really good, and it's truly beneficial. Absolutely. I wouldn't be up here talking about it if I didn't think this gathering was important. But it can't just be a Sunday morning thing for however we're here for an hour. Forget about it. What are you truly pursuing? What takes up most of your time as you think and sit and stew or when you're... When you're what are you investing your time and your money in? These are important things we gotta look at because we might just find that as we get to the end of this life, we'll look back and see that we live for all of these things that were just like bread. They perish. You know what I mean? Man, I don't even know what time it is. What time is it, baby? What time? Oh, man, rude. Okay, well, I gotta be done. Here, yeah. No, I'm not gonna be done. I think I'm just getting old now. It's actually, come on, I, but I won't, it won't take long. Yesterday uh, at the men's, uh, men's breakfast, I shared with the fellows a memorial service of a man named Steve Farrar. If you men have not read Point Man or Finishing Strong by Steve Farrar, oh my gosh, get his books. They are amazing. They've been, uh, me and Zach started reading it way back, man, our, maybe 20 years ago. Um, and this man writes about what does it take to, to live a life of faith. It's just so faithfully, so consistent that at the end of this life, people will say, and Jesus more importantly will say, that is a person who finished strong. A lot of people start well, not everybody ends so well. And the thing, I, I watched all three hours of his memorial service because I was curious. Did this man who preached so much about being a man of integrity and honor, a one-woman man and all of these things. How did it all end? I wish I could show you the video. Uh, the boys saw it yesterday, five or six minutes, of his kids and his wife talking about how he was a man of integrity and honor. Sure, he could be a, a little, um, what, did, what, what, did he, what did he say he was, baby? Grouchy. Or, I mean, he could be irritable, yeah. Ir he could be irritable sometimes. <laughs> They didn't try to paint him as perfect by any means. 
But in those moments when he was irritable and maybe had a, sh- maybe a short temper or said a word that you know, he wasn't in love, he would go to his wife or go to his kids, little as they were, and say, I want you to know that I was wrong and I want you to forgive me. Just an amazing legacy. And I just bring it up because, again, this, all of us should aspire to have our kids and our friends, those who know us best, the, the ones who see us behind closed doors when nobody else is looking, to say of you, man, you finished strong. They focused on those things that are eternal, not on these things that just perish with time. So I hope you'll, in hearing this message, don't let it go in one ear out the other. Really think about what are you pursuing? Is what, how much is Jesus truly your life and how much of your time, effort, and energy is spent not chasing stuff that perishes, but pursuing Jesus Christ and striving to be conformed into his image. That is God's will for your life.